Hello, and welcome to the Carbon Capture Magazine podcast. I am your host, Danielle Pikarski, and today I am joined by Micro Seismics, Peter Duncan. How are you doing today, Peter? You know, I'm very well, thank you, Danielle. I'm sitting on the east coast of Canada on a beautiful sunny day, and it's a lot cooler here <laughs> than it is in my hometown of Houston. Awesome. Well, that sounds lovely. A little bit about Peter. He began his career as an exploration geophysicist with Shell Canada. Peter has since worked for Digicon Geophysical and helped found 3DX Technologies. He previously served as president of the Society of Exploration Geophysicists and president of the Geophysical Society of Houston. He is currently a member of several organizations for geoscientists, and he received the Enterprise Champion Award from the Houston Business Journal in 2010, the World Oil Innovative Thinker Award in 2011, was the 2013 EY National Energy Entrepreneur of the Year, and in 2014, he received the Virgil Kaufman Gold Medal from the Society of Exploration Geophysicists. Peter is now the co-founder, president, and CEO of Microseismic Inc. And wow, Peter, you are certainly very accomplished. And we're excited to have you share your knowledge with us today. So why don't you start off by just telling us a bit about Microseismic? Sure. Microseismic Inc., uh, we founded that in 2003. At the time, the idea was to pivot away from conventional uh, sourced seismic, conventional seismic where you would use dynamite or vibrators as a source, to a more green calling where we were going to use natural earthquakes or man-made sounds from the interior of the earth to try to map reservoir processes. It's really the same technology that's been used for decades to map the interior of the earth. We were just re-engineering that down to reservoir scale. And I like to think of it as we were putting a stethoscope on the chest of the <laughs> reservoir, listening to the squishy sounds that it were emitted as the engineers interacted with it and feeding back to them, interpreting that data to try to be able to give them advice in how to interact with that reservoir, whether we're talking about fracking and doing a better job of that or just producing the reservoir or worrying about the interaction between mm -hmm. wells, as is the big topic today. Awesome. So obviously the focus with reservoirs and carbon capture is storage and sequestration. So what technology does Microseismic bring to the sequestration market? You bet. So with the, we had kind of uh, had our plate full with fracking mm -hmm. from 2003 up until 2019 when, as everyone knows, the oil business domestically kind of backed off a little bit. So we had bandwidth and we took that bandwidth and tried to look for other applications uh, one of the applications that we found was appropriate for our technology was putting permanent arrays around industrial facilities in areas that were subject to karsting or sinkhole. And that we had some success with deploying that technology, particularly in Florida. And as we looked at that application and became aware of the needs for carbon sequestration, for monitoring the sequestration sites, we actually felt that there was a real opportunity for us to re-engineer, once again, our technology towards that particular application. And in fact, it was, it was kind of fortuitous that at that moment, the DOE came out with a proposal request for uh, someone to come up with a turnkey service of a microseismic variety to apply to the monitoring of sequestration sites. And we filled out the application, we let them know that we were already putting in permanent arrays around lots of facilities around the world and, and pitched that we thought our technology would be really quite appropriate for all of the problems that one faces when one is sequestering CO2 and wanting to make sure that the CO2 is there. Uh, the DOE liked our pitch and we got the grant and we're in the process now of doing the engineering and design work in hopes that when that's accepted, we'll get to um, deploy a prototype at a site that the DOE chooses. Awesome. Well, congratulations on that. How convenient. Yeah, it, how convenient of timing. Yeah, well, it's, it just, 
you know, Confucius said that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And it, <laughs> it seems that when we were ready to go to the sequestration, uh, the DOE was ready to entertain our technology. Great. It was perfect. So then the technology must be proven. Have you used it on any sequestration projects prior? That's, that's actually kind of funny because the <laughs> very, very first project that we ever did was a CO2, uh, well, really an enhanced recovery project. Okay. Uh, the, the client was putting away CO2 and getting credit for it, but putting it away as an EOR project in Wyoming. And they were having a little bit of issue with CO2 escaping from the reservoir. And we were uh, approached by them. Uh, we were a new company. They actually helped us buy the equipment to do this work. And we set up in Wyoming over the field for a couple of weeks to see if we could hear the um, movement of the cap rock or the escaping of the CO2 through the cap rock. And in fact, mm -hmm. we were successful in doing so. Uh, but kind of as that data were being processed, at that time, the shale gale took off and we started drinking from the fire hose of the shales <laughs> and never returned to the CO2 problem. So our mm. very first project in 2004 was a CO2 project. We haven't done one since. Mm -hmm. We're just queuing up for it now under this DOE grant. Awesome. And I know you said you kind of work to capture that leaked CO2 that just seeps through the cracks. What other problems does your technology address? So when you're putting CO2 in the ground, uh, you really have, well, at least in my parlance, I think of three distinct problems that you have. Probably foremost in most people's minds is the problem of induced seismicity. Um, one is very aware that as one injects in the ground, you can lubricate faults, and those faults, if they're appropriately oriented uh, to the tectonic stresses, can move, and sometimes the movement could be, could be big enough that they would be felt at the surface and possibly could do damage to infrastructure, but it's a well-understood problem. And if one can detect the precursor events, the small uh, microseismic events that are that lead up to the larger events, then one can intervene and reduce the rate of injection and in a very controlled process shut down that tectonic movement. So that's problem number one, detect the precursors to induce seismic events that could lead to something that would be felt on the surface. And our buried array technology, our permanent Life of field monitoring technology is perfectly designed to do that. We've done that. We've done that. That is one part of the problem that we've done many, many, many times. I have more than 80 of these buried arrays around the world, and almost all of them have been dual purpose for frac monitoring and induced seismicity monitoring. The second problem, beyond these larger events that could get felt at the surface, is to monitor for cap rock and reservoir integrity. Now, the earth is full of faults and fractures. And again, as you're pumping the CO2 into the reservoir, even though you're below the frac gradient, you're not going to break the rock, but you're still going to put this fluid that is slightly pressurized into the faults and fractures. And once again, you can think of it as potentially lubricating those faults and fractures so that they move. We see this a lot in in our frac monitoring work, even when they're not pumping at frac gradient pressures or above frac gradient pressures, where regional faults that are pre-existing will slip and can cause wellbore damage. Well, we're not looking for things quite that large here. What we are worried about, though, are small slips that could create a leak in the cap rock that the CO2 could escape through, or could create a pathway, if the fault moves, create a pathway where the CO2 could escape outside the reservoir. Again, we would, in our buried array, in our permanent life of field monitoring, we would be listening for those very small events. I'm, I'm talking minus two, minus three events. <laughs> now, that probably doesn't mean much to, to the listeners, but a minus two event is about equivalent to the sound of dropping a can of Coke from your waist onto a cement floor. And that thud that little release of energy can be diagnostic of movement, small movements on faults and fractures. 
We listen for those. We map where they are. We look to see if they are repeating from the same area. And if they are, then we let the operator know that they might be developing a leak in their cap rock or a leak in their reservoir. And they can go in and, and, and mitigate that by grouting off the activity. So that's the second. The first is mm-hmm. the large events. The second is the small events. And the third problem is actually tracking where the CO2 is going. Now, that, that's a hard problem for microseismic because the movement of the pressure front, the events are maybe an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude smaller than these little cap rock events. So we're not so confident that from a microseismic point of view, we're going to be able to track the plume. However, the proven technology for tracking the plume is to map the change in velocity or change in seismic impedance that's happening in the injection reservoir, the target reservoir, as the reservoir fills up. And to do that, the best way is to do a 3D survey before you start injecting, 3D seismic survey, and then do subsequent 3D seismic surveys at time intervals, perhaps a year or two years, and map the change in the reservoir's velocity as a result of the permeation of the, uh, of the CO2 through the reservoir. Well, that's expensive. The first 3D, you lay out your geophones, and and then you pick them up. And then if you go back two years later with a crew to lay out the geophones and you shoot into them again, that can be expensive. And you might not get the receivers back in exactly the same place. So now you have to worry about, well, were the changes in what I saw in the second 3D survey a result of, something happening in the reservoir, or was it more the result of where I put my receivers? Well, with our permanent array, we actually bury these geophones 300 feet in the ground and cement Mm. them in. Oh, three or four stations per square mile, so they're quite widely spaced, Mm -hmm. and they're all connected by radios, so we can do this monitoring that we do in real time, 24-7. So if we have that array of geophones of receivers out buried and permanent in the ground then when you come to do your subsequent 3ds you don't have to put new receivers out there and you're using exactly the same receivers that you used on your first and second or whatever surveys so you don't have any problem with the change in receiver response or any artificially introduced anomalies as a result of receiver positioning so while we don't think that our microseismic technology is going to be, oh, first order, the first mm-hmm. order solution for tracking the plume, we do think that we can contribute by having that array there to doing active seismic, to tracking the plume, and to uh, getting that active seismic done more accurately and at a significant reduction in cost. I'm thinking at least Fifty percent of the cost, if not uh, even lower. Awesome. So yeah. those are the three problems: big events that you can feel at the surface, little events that are <laughs> messing up your reservoir or your cap rock, and then tracking the plume, which we can facilitate. Great. Yeah. It sounds like all three, regardless of how large, require a lot of attention to detail. <laughs> Absolutely. And you mentioned large, and that's one of the nice things about our array. When the plume, when you start injecting and you're just around, the plume is just around your uh, injection well, we, our buried array can be very small. Mm-hmm. And as the plume grows and your project grows or you put in extra um, injection wells, we can grow the array with you by just adding more stations at the outside edges. And so really, we're well posed to provide a service throughout the 20, 30, 40 year life that you expect for the injection uh, into your sequestration reservoir. Awesome. Long term. (laughs) Well, I believe I have one question left for you here, and it is actually concerning the National Carbon Capture Conference that's coming up this November we just announced the agenda, and Mike Saunders from MicroSeismic will be speaking at um, this conference. So would you be able to tell us a little bit what we should expect from his presentation? 
Well, Mike's a great speaker, and I think I think the audience, and I hope to be there and in the audience cheering for him. I think the audience will learn a lot about everything I've spoken of. He's going mm-hmm. to speak about how we put in these barrier arrays, how we uh, test what depth to put them at, what the protocol is for bringing the data back, um, the kind of deliverables that we're going to present. But there's going to be one more tweak to what Mike is presenting that's a little bit different than anything I've mentioned uh, yet, and that has to do with tracking the plume. Now, I mentioned when we track the plume with active seismic, what we're looking to do is map the change in velocity or seismic impedance as a result of the mixing of the CO2 in with the normal reservoir brine or fluids. The, we expect the velocity to change, and we should be able to map that. But there's another change that takes place in the reservoir as you inject the CO2, and that is the electrical impedance changes as well. And it's a different physical process. It's a different physical observable. And uh, physicists love to have multiple, uh, what we call independent or orthogonal variables that we can observe in order to have more confidence in what we're observing. So we, uh, since we know that the physics says the resistivity or the conductivity of the reservoir is going to change and perhaps change more dramatically than the seismic impedance does. So we would expect perhaps bigger anomalies. We know that we ought to be able to map that as well in order to accurately track the plume or put a constraint on the seismic uh, data and answers that we've got. So Mike's going to talk about our ideas of how we're going to couple our permanent life of field buried seismic array with a permanent buried life of field electromagnetic array using controlled source EM in order to uh, add to the observations we're making and get a much more accurate measure of where the plume is going and, as an added benefit, be able to see, should there be any CO2 escaping above the cap rock, it ought to cause the same kind of electrical anomaly above the cap rock. And while we don't think we'll see that readily with microseismic, electromagnetically, we should see it very well. So we'll be able to track the plume and have another device by which we can look for leaks. And Mike will be talking about that at your conference. Interesting. Well, I am very excited to hear him speak on that. Again, this is Peter Duncan. CEO, President, and Co-Founder of MicroSeismic. Thank you again, Peter. You can look forward to seeing his colleague Mike Saunders speak at the National Carbon Capture Conference if you plan on attending that in Des Moines this November. And to our listeners, thank you. Until next time. Thank you very much, Danielle.